My, actually, my mother and my father started me. Um, basically, I come from like a family of the, from the business, music business. My father played with Stan Kenton's orchestra, and my mother sang for a lot of very, very huge jazz artists and sang backgrounds and stuff. But I think, <coughs> I think actually where I got started was I started playing actually with my dad's like four-piece band at uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, that kind of type of thing, or help him load gear, and he had like a he had a, a a Datsun, an old Datsun Nissan like station wagon that he would put his keyboards in and stuff, and he kind of just would drag me along, and and then all of a sudden he'd let me play guitar a couple times in the van and stuff. But that's kind of like where I started, um, basically from really from there. Um, my family was uh, we had these two really amazing people that came to my family and actually got us started. They wanted us to be kind of like the new Partridge family. And uh, it was a really great experience. The guy's name, the manager's name was Wally Watson, and the writer's name was Skip Soder. And, um, I, think that's, I think that's when I really started getting into writing and being a writer, uh, was from, a, from this gentleman, Skip Soder, who was just this magical writer and he, he'd written for Joan Baez and different people and he came to write music for my family to sing. So we ended up doing some um, kind of a little tour of the different colleges in the LA Basin and uh, I think that's where I really caught the bug of performing and really wanting to do stuff. Also my mother would, um, my mother and father are both uh, educators from the LA City School Districts and uh, my father was the principal, my mother the administrator. So my mother would put together this kind of like um, troop of people that would go and perform for different high schools. And when I was really young, she would take me out and I'd play acoustic guitar and stuff, um, and play a couple songs and stuff. So, uh, and by the way, right now, if you hear this in the background, that's Jack Russell, and he's doing his warm down right now. So, um, hats off to Jack. Um, but I think that's where I really get started. And my first band. Oh my gosh, I'm trying to rush it along. Um, I can't really think of the name of the band, but my parents, my mother took me to go audition for this band that was kind of like a Rolling Stones type of band. And they were playing like, uh, uh, they were doing the uh, mall circuits of the, the, at malls on the weekends. They would have like groups play in the middle of the mall and stuff. Uh, but that's where my humble beginnings from. Uh, and when I was in high school, I had a high school band, and my the band's name was Tori, and my last name, like, like wow. It's kind of, you know, pretty simple. Um, but we did a lot of the backyard circuit in Pasadena, Montebello, Monrovia, oh my gosh, uh, Diamond Bar. I mean, e everywhere that you could think of on the east side of, of LA, we were doing a lot of clubs, uh, punk rock clubs and, um, and such. But that's where I started, was in the backyard. I was playing in the backyard, rehearsing in a garage, writing songs, you know, playing, uh, Playing a lot of different covers, you know, we pretty much stuck to like to the '70s covers, Bowie and, and what have you. And, um, but from there on, I just went in to start uh, meeting different people in Hollywood. I would uh, take the bus from Montebello, where I grew up, and uh, I would take the bus into Hollywood and Sunset Strip and uh, hook up with different folks and different people that kind of taught me the the way to get in and you know get with the band. And so I I was still in my three-piece high school band. And I'm trying to remember this all right now with what's going on over there too, right? Now. So I'm trying to do it. I promise, Mark, I love you. I'm trying really hard because uh, I really want to start laughing and doing and, and joking around. But so I'm trying to be serious. Um, it, it was it was kind of like the I was so enchanted by the magical. You're know, growing up in Los Angeles too. It's you know you kind of grow up in a Disneyland-esque type of. Um, lifestyle, you know, everybody, because Disneyland is there, and when I was a kid, everything was very magical, so Hollywood was very magical for me, and to be able to go into there and, and to uh, show my wares as a musician was was really difficult at that time, because um, there wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of Hispanic artists, and uh, there was, it was, it was a different time back then, so I really needed to be really top-notch, really good, because I was coming into some place from the inner cities and coming into Hollywood where a lot of bands and people and guys that I admired, they just lived in Hollywood and they were these amazing artists and, you know, rock, rock bands. So I came from the inner cities and came out there and, you know, I, it was just a, it was just a, 
I'll never forget, I like to tell this story because it's, it's a true story. The first time I ever came to Hollywood, like really, and I thought I was really cool and hip and rad, and, you know, which I wasn't. And I came in, and one of the first people I, first band I actually really met was Motley Crue. And uh, we came walking into the parking lot of the Rainbow, and, and back then there was nothing, there was just like a brick wall, and people would just kind of like lean up against it, but, and walk into the Rainbow and blah, 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 blah. Uh, now it's completely different, but uh, Vince Neil was uh, was standing up against the wall with these two crazy chicks, hot chicks, and and, uh, and I'll, I'll never forget this because he said to me, he goes, "Hey man, we don't like blankety blanks here in Hollywood. You guys need to go back to where you came from." And I'll never forget that because it was something that I, I'd never heard that before. I was like, "Wow, this is who the fuck is this guy telling me?" You know. You guys get you blankety blanks and you you blanks need to get back to blah blah blah, blah. and I just looked at him and I go who the fuck are you fucking what the, what the fuck are you and like the guys that I was playing with they were just street guys I mean, they were from the streets punk rock guys uh, Sam and David and they weren't taking kindly to anything they would just knock somebody out just to knock somebody out so when that all went down this well, there was a little melee and then from from out of the from out of the, the other side there comes Nikki. Nikki can't. Nikki Six came walking up, and he, he says, "Hey man, don't fuck with my singer, man. It's my fucking singer." And blah blah blah. The fuck with you? And blah blah blah. I said, "Your singer said fucking this." And he says, "Oh yeah, he said that. Then, he, then you need to get the fuck out of here." So I was like, "Fuck you, dude. What are you guys wearing high heels for? You guys are a bunch of fucking blah blah blah." So we got into it, and then out of out of nowhere, this magical angel comes, whose name is Tommy Lee, who I love with all my heart. Came out of nowhere. He goes, "Whoa, whoa, 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 dude. Fuck, calm down. Everybody, relax, dude. Relax." Dude, what's up, dude? I said, what's going on? It's like, what's your name, man? It's like, and Tom and his mark. He goes, right on, dude. He goes, Cause you're, you're rad, dude. I can take this whole man. This guy's cool, man. This guy's cool. This, this is cool. It's, you know. And Tommy came and just kind of severed everything down, you know. And I'll never forget that. And after that, we became really good friends. I would come into Hollywood, and um, they accepted me for what I was, you know. And, and Tom, Nikki would always be really sweet and kind to me, and pull me over and invite me to their, their fucking crazy ass pad right there off, off Larby, Larby right next to the whiskey and um, and Vince was just you know it's always been a sweetheart I just love him to death but that's kind of my first baptism of fire when I came to Hollywood I was like wow really well then I really got to prove myself to these fools because they you know I'm I, I'm cool over in my neck of the woods in Montebello but I am no, I don't know nobody here in Hollywood, wow, these guys are rad. So come and see me, you know. Ty's like, dude, come and fucking see the band. You we gotta come and see us play. So then I went to go see the play. I was like, holy oh, fuck, oh my gosh, these guys are fucking so rad. What a gnarly set, you know. It's like, wow, we gotta. And so we, and then we go back, you know, back home and go, dude, we gotta step this shit up. You know, we really gotta. But so that was my baptism of fire of meeting somebody who, um, a band that I completely admire and, and love and, and just have so much respect for because. I knew what they what they were all about when they were so poor, you know, and they were working so hard to become what they became, you know. That that to me, I was very very lucky for that. Um, the person actually that discovered me that actually pulled me into that whole thing was a, was a cat by the name of Greg Jeffrey. Kisses to Greg because I love him with all my heart. Um, from Angel, a band called Angel, and I was rehearsing in, with my three piece band. Um, at a place called Rosemary's Baby Studio. The people that were rehearsing there were Angel, um, Tim Bogart, um, oh my God, a comment, comment of peace, and Ed Van Halen. And they had like this three-piece band and they were rehearsing there too, and missing persons. So my bass player, Sam Moreno, found this place in the valley where this guy that he knew, a friend of his, was running this rehearsal place. So we went there to rehearse. Here's us in this high school, you know, senior high school band. And when we were playing, the guy, Greg would come walking in, you know, and, and, and it was like, oh shit, you know, it's so scary, dude. It's like, oh my gosh, there's Greg Jeffrey from Angel. Ah, we're all freaking out. Because they were like the, the good kiss, you know, there was Kiss and then there was Angel back in the day. So, but he took me underneath, under his wing, and really taught me all the ropes, introduced me to everybody. He would bring, um, he brought Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley to my shows at the Troubadour when I was in the high school band, you know. He really believed in my talent, um, and he's the the one true person who I I don't want to get too emotional, but he he really 
helped me and believed in me where other people did not believe in me. Where they saw the color of my skin first and then they wanted to see what, what, what the talent was. And it was very much like that back, back then, but he didn't see that. He, he saw through that, he didn't see color. He, he saw um, a kid that was fresh and that was talented and maybe with a little shining up, you know, could possibly do something. So he's the one that helped me. He introduced me to the guys uh, in the Cheap Trick, Robin Zander, Pete Comita at the time, who, who taught me different things, how to play different you know, chords and how to write music. And, you know, Greg would sit around and we would write and he would bring me into his rehearsal studio so that we could I could listen to what they were doing. And, uh, and those, that's pretty much the beginning of where I came in before that. And then um, during that period, uh, when I was, when Greg was helping me with different things, uh, I was able to audition for Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, Greg got me an audition with Ozzy and Sharon, who I love with all my heart. Uh, gave me a big opportunity to come and play with the band. I rehearsed with the band for, for, for a minute, and uh, we were, I was supposed to go with them to Europe to start playing in England at the time, right when Brad Gillis left the band. But uh, they left me behind. I was at my folks' house, and. Uh, we were waiting there, waiting there for a car to come pick us up. We waited for two days and Sharon called the house and talked to my mom and just said, you know, we love your son, but we just feel he's too young right now. And we're so close to, you know, Randy's passing that Ozzy and Mark were getting real close and, you know, we were piling around who I just love him to death. And they ended up getting um, a guitar player by the name of Bernie Torme to finish out the tour because Brad Gillis had, was leaving to go play with Night Ranger. So that was a moment there. And then, uh, I also, uh, before uh, before the Bull Boys, this was before the Bull Boys, I also, um, Gene uh, Simmons and Paul Stanley pulled me in to audition for KISS. And that was a really amazing moment because I'm such a huge KISS fan and, fan and, and uh, I just loved them to death because those two guys came to see me play at a club on Greg's word, Greg Tuffer's word, uh, to come and see this kid play, you know. Um, and I'll never forget that because they gave me that opportunity to come in and audition for them and play with them. And it was great. It, it didn't work out, but it was, it was so great to be able to do that. And uh, Gene has always been like, kind of like six degrees separation. He was actually going to be the producer of our first record, but uh, you know, we ended up signing with Warner Brothers and Ted Temple and blah, blah, blah. But all these little things that were there that I experienced that um, really helped me with different things. Also too, when I, Going back to Ozzy, I'm trying to condense this too, so I'm so sorry if I'm rolling so fast and, and it sounds like gibberish, but um, right after the Ozzy thing, I was very close with Steve, Steve Piercy and, and Robin Crosby from Wrath, and we were really, really good friends. And uh, I think they kind of felt really bad for me when the thing didn't pan out, so Steven brought me into the band. He says, listen man, I want you to come in and play Rat. you know, you can be a rat. And it's like, oh fuck, this is rad. So I ended up playing in Rat for about, probably about a year, um, and that's when Bobby had just gotten into the band and won, and I was really young, and you know, um, but Stephen, uh, who I love dearly, was uh, very instrumental in, in stuff before I, before I did the Bullet Boys. So was Robin Crosby, who I just miss and love so much. He was, people don't realize what a musical genius that guy was, and what a huge, gigantic heart that guy, that guy had. He was always like, you know, it's always stick up for me, and he was just such a sweet fucking heart, you know. And uh, those, those guys, you know, they, they really helped me and pushed me when they actually told me that, you know, they had somebody else that was going to come in, which was Warren, blah, 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 blah. But Stephen, even after that, was very um, uh, nurturing to my talent and wanted, always pushing me, come on, man, you got to fucking do something, you know. You can't just sit around and look at all these guys in Hollywood. That's not you. You got to get a band together. You and Lonnie got to do something, you know, so. It, that's where it, it kind of just kind of all started there, you know, and uh, I, I'm a product of the, uh, not necessarily the Sunset Strip, but uh, we started at you know, the Troubadour, so we were, we were more of a product of the South Bay and uh, Montebello uh, inner city area, that's, you know, that's kind of like where my band came from. Um, so we didn't really always dig the whole Sunset Strip vibe because we were never a, really a Sunset Strip band. We never, you never played the Dancing Waters Club in San Pedro, playing punk rock places in LA, you know, any place we could go and, and um, do our wares. And so, real quick, I just want to go to this because I say this kind of, uh, not, uh, last is never least, because uh, 
I was very, 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 very fortunate when I played at the Troubadour, where a lot of amazing artists have come out of that uh, amazing club uh, for many, many years. It was the two guys that came to see me one night. And I don't know if they came to see me or if they were just there. I'm sure they were just there having a good time because it was one guy's birthday. And those two people were David Lee Roth and Alex Van Halen. Um, and we were playing and they were hooting and hollering, sitting in the back bar. You know, when we were fucking, we were kids, dude. Uh, oh gosh, uh, the year, the year. Uh, let's see, let me think really quick. Oof. Early 80s, maybe 80, 81, you know, right out of high school, uh, right, right, right about there. Um, and there they were one night. And th there, was a lot, there was a lot of people there because we, we had a really decent following, which was rad. That's why they let us play there. So, <laughs> you know, and there's these two guys, and we're scared to fucking death because these two guys are there because they're just like our heroes and they're from Pasadena and you know we're from Montevallo and, and you know, it's this whole thing of you know where they were and you know we always try to get into the shows but we never could get in you know <laughs> when they were fucking playing all that kind of stuff so we after we finished the show um, the manager came over and goes hey David wants to meet you and Alex they want you guys to have a drink with them so we went over to him and David introduced himself and he said, listen, you guys are, you guys are from Montebello, right? He said, yeah. He goes, man, you guys are fucking awesome, great song. And Alice is going, you guys are really great. He goes, so this is what we're going to do. This is my pal Al and it's his birthday tonight. And we we're going to do, we're going to do shots. So we ended up doing shots with David and Alex, man. And that was the first time that I ever was privileged and, and very blessed to meet uh, the guys from Van Halen and, they kind of brought me in, I, not brought me in, but I was just that guy that was there and, you know, I got, got to hang out with Ed and Rudy Liren and, um, and to see what went on behind the scenes of Van Halen and that really spurred me to do the bull, to, to do something at a very high level because I got to see the rehearsals and the behind the scenes and, and uh, Edward was so kind to me, man, just such a sweetheart. And Alex was just so rad to me. And Michael, who I love so dearly, just so fucking, he was just such a badass. And, you know, every time I see you, you say, family, what's going on? You know, it's like, you know, so even David, he, David was just such a, uh, I would just hang out with him. Like, just, we always hang out with the together. I don't know whether he just trusted me, but they, they kind of brought me into that whole thing, you know, Mark? It was, and I really learned about what the business was all about and how bad ass you had to be. I mean, to be able to be back then and to remember the things that I saw and how kind they were to me, you know, this guy, this, you know, just this musician guy, but that they had love for me because of my talent and to be able to have me, to be able to be back there at those rehearsals at Zoho Trump Studios that they used to have for two weeks. They would do two week rehearsals and they would invite at least 300, 400 people in these huge airport hangar type of places to put on these shows. <coughs> and it would just dumbfound me because they were on every single night. They would do the whole show. Not with the lights and everything, but, and David would explain, this is where blah, 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 we're gonna do this. And, but they would throw these huge parties for everybody. They were just huge trash cans full of, of, of beer and, and, and uh, uh, soft drinks and whatever you wanted to drink and just tables full of like, these huge hero sandwiches and stuff, you know, with a big giant pink Christmas tree in the corner with a bunch, you know, those guys, I, I was really lucky to see all that, man. So after that, when we, when I got, I got schooled so hard, it was time for me to do something that was original and something that was completely different. And that took me dropping the guitar. Me and Lonnie Vincent hooked up, we were brothers. We'd been in different bands, local bands. And he had the vision and I had the vision of doing something at a very high level because he had worked with Carmen and Peace and King Cobra and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we, I, I was like kind of like a scout guy for a little bit in King Cobra and that's where we met Mick Sueda. Mick Sueda, we, me and Lion decided that Mick would be a perfect fit for us because he liked the same music, had the same attitude. And then uh, basically Jimmy, I, I, Jimmy grew up uh, in Montebello and he was one of the badass drummers in Montebello and that's and I, he he I gave him a chance to and the guys gave him a chance to you know prove himself because he was a little younger than our, than we were 
and he came in and destroyed the fucking thing. So we just had this like, it's just this clash, of, this badass clash of guys that really wanted to do something at a high level. And we worked very, very di diligently in a, in a rehearsal room in Vernon. Uh, we started the band in Mommy's Mother's Garage in Carson, California. Um, and we worked very diligently. Um, I had to give it up to, uh, to Lonnie because the vision that we had, we wouldn't let anybody tell us any different. And back then, people weren't really happy with us showing up at parties and stuff because we were just out of control, man. And we would just come in and just create havoc. And people were like, no, dude, no, you guys are coming in here. You know, but it was him and his brother, Michael, uh, Mike Vincent, and his, his mother, Barbara, and his father, you know, Mike, man, Big Mike, and my parents, Carmen and Joe, who had that vision, who, who put their money into the band, the little money that they had that believed in us to get us to get it, being able to do a demo. We did a demo with Garth Richardson, who I love. Kisses to Garth. I love him with all my heart because without Garth, I don't think there would be this. Uh, he taught us so much in the studio so quickly that we needed to do stuff, and he did our demo. Um, we had some other huge people that uh, people that uh, were uh, that listened to the demo, but there was one person that heard the demo, which she's just, just an angel, Roberta Peterson, who is Ted Templeman's sister. She heard it and Ted loved it. Ted came into our rehearsal studio, came in and said, listen, I want you guys to play all your material. I'll raise my hand and it, it, it just stop. So he didn't raise his hand the whole time that we were there and we were able to uh, hopefully impress us, impress him with what we were doing and he knew we were serious. And uh, he took his, had his glasses on, he took his glasses off and he says, I want to ask you guys a question. Would you guys like to do a record together? We said yes. We were, we're, you know, we we're like, oh yeah, fuck yeah, because so, he was our he was our first pick of anybody to do to do us was Ted, because of everything that he's done, just all of his work, uh, including Van Halen, Doobie Brothers, Doobie Brothers, what have you, everything. He was just this magical wizard that we really wanted to record with. So that was basically it. We went into pre-production. Got it signed with Warner Brothers Records, um, with Mo Austin, Lenny Warnerker, Roberta Peterson, and Ted Templeman. Um, who I love with all my heart. Um, and that was the beginnings of the Bullet Boys. Um, and I left out one little thing. Um, I learned how to tour when I was signed with Motown Records. Um, one of the, I think I'm one of the few artists that was ever signed with Motown Records. Benny Medina and Carrie Ashby McCordy Jr. signed me to a company, a production company called Pocket Rock Productions. And I did a record called Cagney and the Dirty Rats. And I learned so much there from there up from that record and shout out to Benny Medina because without Benny Medina I, I don't think because he was so vocal in pushing me to do things and taught me so much about the business about writing songs bringing me around these amazing artists in Motown at the time of being signed there and being able to see all these people uh, these just geniuses and bringing me into the studio to listen to people and different things. So uh, when I was signed with Motown also, um, I was also able to work with Al DeBarge. I did, uh, did a lot of touring with Al DeBarge. Shout out to Al, I love you. And also uh, a guy by the name of Kennedy Gordy, who is a guy who created Rockwell. Somebody's watching me, who bring, brought Michael Jackson in to sing that song. So I was always around these amazing cats who I never get to talk about. So hopefully now people get a little uh, insight in Mark Torian's um, life and uh, I really want to thank Mark too, Mark Weiss. I really want to thank you because you've been such a dear friend for many years and uh, I've always been rooting for my band and, and always been loving on me so I love you with all my heart and I love you so hard. And thank you for having me and to give you this little insight of, of the rock and roll business uh, through Mark Torian's eyes. Take care. Love you.